the CT5V. We are going to take a very serious approach to this car. There's going to be so much technical detail. You're going to have to hang in there. You're going to learn a lot. The interior space, this is a very special experience for somebody that is a driver, somebody that loves it. The interior space is a mix of traditional leather materials and then of course you have the carbon fiber accents all over. Now with the 5, luckily you get the upgraded AKG audio system, so we're going to put the charts up here so you can see that. It is pretty neutral overall, I'll be honest. It's a little bass heavy for my taste, but all the traditional uh, controls here for HVAC are perfect. They do not mess around with any touchscreen crap, no haptics, none of that, which means usability-wise, this is something you're gonna wanna keep long-term. So, now with, of course, the difference in infotainment screen from the CT4. You got a bigger screen, the backup cameras and the 360 cameras are much better. It just seems like they're clear. There's just, just more concise in terms of knowing where the hell you're at. Now there is special touches of detail. The carbon fiber buckets have backs or carbon fiber backs. The seats feel just tremendous in here. This is just such a GT car that you can also have a lot of fun with. I mean, I don't know if people are going to actually have fun with this, and I haven't had a chance to do much of that, but I can see why somebody would buy this car and drive it every single day. The steering wheel controls feel very high quality, and then the displays. And one thing I love about what Caddy does or GM does here. Now that I'm going to have rubber in my lungs for about three years now because of you, straight monkey <laughs> man over here. We're talking about the CT5V Blackwing, Jack, and there is a ton of ton of information to cover. God bless Tony Roma. He is the chief engineer on this product, and I'm sure he had a photo of me on his desk because when he designed this car, he designed it to be a baboon machine, and hopefully in this video we're going to demonstrate that. But not only did Tony Roma support us in this video, Ben Pohl from Brembo and Stefan Cross from Cadillac Product Communications also helped us out. So GM has really gone above and beyond to provide us all the information we could possibly ask for. Now before we get cranking here, Jack, yes. uh, we did a CT4V video, which this is shared. There's a lot of things that are shared between the two. So we're not gonna completely rehash everything. If you want a ton of technical detail, watch that video, The at least the underbody part. And we're gonna kind of connect the dots with this. So let's start. So this is also on a variation of the Alpha platform, and this is technically the spiritual successor to the prior generation CTSV. However, they did alter the Alpha platform for this car. The suspension kinematics and the geometry have both been altered and improved for this vehicle. They changed the caster of the front wheels to put it more in line with something like a Camaro Z01 1LE. And they also changed the front stiffness of those vehicles well to support the added caster and the sheer amount of G-forces this vehicle can produce. And the rear, the rear cradle compared to a regular CT5V or CT5, has also been dramatically stiffened. In the front here as well, if you look at these shear plates, they've increased the local stiffness of certain parts of the suspension up to 132%. This car is still a strut front vehicle. However, GM does allow full alignment capability in the front. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? They do have some slots where the bolts go into the strut to mate to the upright. So when you pull that bolt out, there's enough slop in there to move it front and back without having to change the bolts out or drill any slots in there to move it. And it's good enough to get somewhere between 2.5 or 2 degrees of negative camber almost all, all the way to 3, depending on the car, of course. Which is exactly what you want in a car you might take to the track. track. And one that is also strut because typically you need more camber on a strut car because the you don't get progressive camber change as much, although this is a dual ball joint lower part of the front suspension it's not like a traditional strut so there might be some more dynamic camber that you get out of this than a, a traditional setup but again 
the alignment capabilities there are super important. Yes, just like in the CT4V Blackwing, the lower control arms on this car are aluminum and the front subframe is aluminum. In the rear, just like you get in the CT4V as well, the lower control arms are aluminum, but the subframe itself is steel. This car also has the fourth generation of Magna Ride dampers built by DW BWI. And with that, they've managed to add a couple important improvements. There's now active dive and squat control, so it'll mitigate brake dive and basically it'll better deal with the movements of the body of this vehicle. And they also added sensors in the lower control arm so they can now separate wheel control from body control. So based upon what drive mode you're in, they can prioritize and tour the body control to make it nice and soft and give it a really good GT ride. And then in track or sport, they can prioritize wheel control to maximize wheel traction. So if you're going flat out around VIR, mm -hmm. it'll better prioritize giving this car good body control. And the microprocessors are faster now. That's also one of the things that has allowed them to make these big improvements. This also changed the fluid in the dampers to stop cavitation. Basically the problem with dampers is that they get more heat. The fluid in them, even despite these being magnetic, have cavitation issues so where the consistency is no longer there. Which is also the same story with every shock. Heat or cold affects the either the oil or the magnetic fluid in there so you can go from a really stiff ride when it's cold to a kind of a weird uneven ride when they heat soak essentially when there's too much heat in there. Honestly Mark this is basically science fiction that's something you talked about. And it, that's why the name of this video is called Science Fiction. Now you might want to joke around about, oh, it's rear wheel drive, V8, it's old school. This is the farthest thing. And you're going to notice whether it's EV cars or anything, this type of technology is the future because we're talking about electromechanical systems. Suspension, regardless if it's an EV or an internal combustion car, obviously the way you set it up is different, but all these subsystem controls of steering rack, the dampers, the braking system, the differentials, or you know all the stability control systems that are baked into cars, these are getting more advanced. So while you have this seemingly old school stuff, it's not really that old school. There's still a ton baked in here. Let's talk about the brakes. So you have two different options on this car. You have a steel Brembo option, or you have these CCM carbon ceramics. We spent a lot of time talking to Ben and Tony about these brakes, and you start, Mark. You okay. Walk me through it. So at a high level, both of them are track capable. So if you get the steels, you can still go to the track. If you get the carbons, you can go to the track. The pad material on the carbons or on this car is more aggressive than what you get on the CT4 Blackwing. So this is just a, an overall more aggressive setup. They are big. They are very big. And the material they used for the carbon ceramic matrix is CCM. What that means is that they use long strain carbon fiber material instead of short strain. And now I'm gonna let you explain why. So essentially with CCMs, with the longer strains of carbon fiber that are found in these rotors, it allows for a quicker thermal transfer between the pad and the rotor itself. And the cool thing about that is it means it helps the rotor deal with thermal shock better. And so there's kind of a misconception and you know we've talked about this a little bit with carbon ceramics being less resistant to heat more sensitive to thermal shock, and they are also not as good for track use. Now, Brembo, our Brembo rep, who is Who's also an, an engineer, engineer. He, and not just a sales dude, uh, he's also a sales dude too, <laughs> but, but the, the reality is they're just as efficient and just as capable as their steel counterparts. The only difference is cost. So in their dynamometer of the brake rotor testing. They put them in a machine, they run simulated cycles, lap miles with the right heat and all that. They put it in their dynamometer and these rotors lasted 660 laps. Which they approximate to being 15 hours on the track, okay. which is... <laughs> it's a lot. So the point is they're gonna hold up just as much as the steels. You're just gonna get more bent over when you go to replace them. So if all you're doing is track and you don't wanna bleed money, Go to the steels. And unlike the steels, they don't dust. And theoretically, if you aren't tracking this car, in reality, many yes. people aren't, this should last the lifetime. The calipers, the rotor should last the lifetime of the vehicle. And the fact that Cadillac bakes in cooling, which we've talked about on the CT4, there are brake ducts here from the front of the car to these control arm mounted diverters. Now there is a dust shield more on the bottom half of this brake than there is on the, the steels. And part of it is they probably need to do some protection of the disc. They're a little bit more sensitive to impacts, but there is a ton of open area. Impacts from debris, debris. not from uh, impacts on the road. From right, yeah, debris, bumps. debris impacts. 
So, you, you know, there is so much surface area here. There's so much open airflow. So cooling them is, I mean, they do a really good job with that. And I think the last thing to talk about, these are two piece. Yes. And the Brembo's, the steels are two piece and they are floating design. And it allows the floating design of this with the bobbins allows that hat that is aluminum to move separately from the rotor disc itself for when you're getting into high heat situations. It allows that flexibility of movement. So typically that would cause noise and more race applications. And that's why they stay away from like two piece discs that are floating. But Brembo puts tension on the hat through the bobbins with a spring to keep that contact, the hat and the rotor somewhat pressurized. So as you're getting hot, it's not making a bunch of noise on the road. Now there are cross drillings here, but they're very minor and they've chosen a pad material that also works with the cross drilled holes where one, it's not as noisy, and two, you don't get a ton of pad, pad buildup in the holes either. There. The separation, too, of the two-piece also allows them for more even pad wear. These and are on top of that, yes. the caliper, they are monoblocks in the front. Yes. Uh, so the monoblock is a much more rigid structure, and the way that they designed the pistons in the caliper, they are different sizes. So they, they, they use different size pistons because they avoid pad tapering. So you don't get an uneven pad where when you're driving hard, you take a pad off and one end's lower than the other. So the, the mix of piston size, obviously mixed with the master cylinder and all that, it's, it's, it's preventing pad, pad taper along with the uh, rigid caliper and, and all the other things that go into the brakes. There's a lot, bottom line, there's a shitload that goes into it. <laughs> Translation, when they did testing for this vehicle, one of their tests they were looking for is they could stop this car from 200 miles an hour, full, like full gross occupant weight for, of this car, four or five passengers full of luggage from 200 miles an hour, what, a hundred times or something? I don't know what, I don't, it, it's, I don't think it was a hundred times, but it was, it was enough to, to make sure that somebody wasn't going to be stupid. The big thing with brakes and Tony, or not Tony, but uh, the ben. ben explained, you know, from a liability standpoint, they have to look at what if somebody goes out on the Autobahn going 200 miles an hour in like 30 degrees weather and then they just, or 30 degree Fahrenheit weather and then just stands on the brakes when the rotors are cold and the brake system's cold. That's the worst thing you can do. So a lot of this testing is to say, okay, we're gonna shock the hell out of the brake system and you're not gonna crash the car. That, that's the goal. They're amazing, basically. <laughs> yeah. This is also still brake by wire. We beat it to death in the CT4V video, but essentially your pedal is not attached to anything, it's like an eye racing. It's a right? load cell, yes. yeah, it's a load cell. It's a digital pedal that only engages if there's a brake by wire failure and there's a fail safe plunger that goes into the master for an emergency stop. That does not help you if you blow a brake line or your pads fly off yeah. or the cat, you lose a wheel, you're not gonna stop. It's just for those actuators failing to give you a physical connection. There's no temp sensors here and there's no temp sensors in the actuators or brake cylinder. So the electronics are doing all of that. One thing to add about brake by wire here that we didn't talk about on the CT4 is the, the brake by wire systems are not as robust as the manual brake systems or the traditional hydraulic systems where you're pushing. So there's not as much force created by brake by wire. So part of that design is they have to make more rigid calipers. They have to make the brake fluid, the less brake fluid. So all of these efficiencies have to be baked in on a brake by wire system to make this work. So it's another, at least in this day and age, brake by wire is not as advanced as where it needs to be yet. So Brembo is having to make the physical rotor design and caliper design more efficient to make the brake by wire system work right. Before we get into the back and talk about the rear diff and the rear suspension, I do want to talk about the arrow in this car. The CT5V Blackwing is less arrow intensive than the CT4V Blackwing. However, if you get the aero package, which is the carbon fiber package one, it does reduce lift. It is a functional package. It reduces lift by like 83% or something along those lines. So if you are going flat out at 200 miles an hour, the rear end of this car won't st start to suddenly get real light, which is a terrifying thing to happen when you're doing <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> those yeah, kind of speeds. Well, the speeds yeah. that these cars are capable of are just, you know, a lot of these new sports cars are not. So this is, it's a liability, so I think it's like, well, we got a budget to fix all this stuff. It's for performance and safety. I think the other thing is to talk about the, I'm gonna have you talk about the rear diff here, Jack. So this, again, it is a multi-link rear end. You still have the Magna Ride dampers, but you do have an E-diff. It is a clutch-based limited slip in the rear that is electronic. Essentially, there's an electronic pump that actuates the clutches in the rear diff. The E-diff is controlled by the drive modes. The drive modes are looking at steering angle, suspension mode, so if you're on tour, sport, track, and then what PTM mode you're in, so what stability mode you're in on top of what drive mode you're in. So we'll show this chart where it walks you through 
This stability mode, so like race two, will give you the most amount of slip before it cuts in with the rear diff and timing. So it stops the car from basically making you spin out. It's steps. Yes. It's basically all these individual steps of traction, stability, that you can work your way up until an almost, essentially it's an offsetting, right? But you can, yes. Essentially it's almost an offsetting. It'll basically be hero mode that's race two, where you can get some slip, it'll catch you if things go horribly wrong. However, the difference here is it still has an e-diff. So there's still electronics there, even though you have a manual trans. Mm -hmm that electronic diff is still slipping and unslipping those clutches. It's not an on and off switch to transfer. Yeah. So you still have a little bit of that going on. Or you can turn it totally off, which is what I do to get this thing to slide like a total baboon. It is a really cool system. And unlike in my C7 Grand Sport, Cadillac worked very, very well on taking a more holistic approach to getting the diff to feel natural. It knows when you want to get it totally yeah. sideways, but when you're on the track or driving on your favorite back road, it isn't this weird on-off kind yeah. of vague setting in the rear. So to expand on that just one more bit, this yes. is what we are talking about earlier with all the electronic systems. So the, the way the tuning goes, and we talked about this in the other car, is you know, all these engineers go out with the fine tuning and they're looking at laptop data. They're doing data logging as somebody's driving around on the track. They're like, okay, I'm feeling this. They look at the data like, okay, we need to be a little bit less aggressive with the engagement of the clutch packs in the back, back it off couple percent it's the fine tuning of all these electronic systems and it is it i will say this is the future of cars and that's why it, it's kind of a joke the science fiction element it's you get into a really raw mechanical car an older car and you're just like why does this feel so connected and you start to realize when you drive these cars there's you are losing something here it is making you a way more competent driver because it's doing everything more for you and it's making the accessibility level way higher the bandwidth of the product is actually yes. more people can drive this and not die and on top of that more people are expecting more things so this is something we always yeah. talk about it's very difficult to get a car to be dr jekyll and mr hyde right. a total cruiser still a cadillac and still be able to post the lap time around vir sub 250 yeah in a car that is what 4200 pounds or something this is a very heavy car that is huge you can fit your dogs and your kids in this and go flat out around a racetrack and, and tony joked around and, and there's truth to this you take the same car and you strip all these electronic systems off here you put a supercharged engine like a mechanical differential on the back and like a traditional brake setup and no electronics and you put journalists out there in that in a 700 horsepower car they're gonna stuff it. And if yep. journalists are gonna stuff it, then your average driver that's gonna buy this is gonna stuff it. So a lot of these systems now as cars have gotten more ridiculous are a necessity for their customer base, like it or not. That's that's a true story, yes. there's, there's no way around it. So Mark, the last thing I wanna talk about while we're under here before we get underneath the hood is the transmissions. You have two different transmissions. You have a 10 speed, which is the GM 10, 10 speed that you've seen in other performance applications, or you have a TR6060. What's in this car? It is a six speed manual is a different TR6060 that is in the CT4V. The main difference is it can support more torque. It has okay. stronger internals. It also has cooling under here for the gearbox and rear diff. So if you look right here, Mark, there is a cooler, an oil cooler essentially, and it runs lines across the entire length of this vehicle to the rear diff and to the transmission. And there is a high temperature and a low temperature system, which we'll talk about a little bit under the hood. And we're going to have graphs here that's just going to show you. It's way easier to say. But what I will what I will talk about briefly is when you have a high performance machine like this, that it's constantly hitting 130 plus miles an hour on certain tracks. You've got to cool all this. So that this is super important to them uh, that you're not going to get out in like my LC500, right? Yes. Cool car, amazing car. You go four or five laps and everything's overheating because there's no cooling. So this is a GT car that can ride like a boat, essentially, yeah. essentially a boat, and then go out and you just go flat out in it. But the consequence of doing that is you're creating a lot of complexity in, in coolers and coolant lines. You know, you have that here, there, lines running across the center of the car to the rear differential, to the transmission, to the oil. You have all these lines that you have to keep an eye on and maintain. Have a warranty. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a good time, Jack. Let's head under the hood. All right. Um, so if you're still alive and with us and not passed out, I feel like it's so amazing to have this much information on the car so you really understand what the hell's going on. But the engine is a huge part of why this car is attractive, at least in this kind of the end of the era for this type of thing. So tell me about it. This is the last V8 and that is confirmed from Tony Roma that 
a Cadillac will ever have in one of these cars. Last manual as well. And a little touch on Tony is he worked on the LS7 development, so he knows a thing or two about V8s. This is an LT4. This is found in the ZL1 and the Z06, the Camaro and Corvette respectively. This car was not necessarily... The old Z06. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this was not designed for either of those cars. Specifically, this was a motor that this V and the prior generation CTS-V were both in mind for when they were designing this motor. This motor, unlike those other cars though, is a wet sump versus a dry sump, though its internals are largely the same. So it still has a titanium valve train, which means it is faster revving essentially. Yeah, they're looking for throttle response, response revability yes. that, that, to make it feel like a more higher strung, more naturally aspirated in some cases. When they were developing this motor or improving it for the CT5V Blackwing, throttle response and response of the engine was one of their priorities. So they benched things like Ferraris and BMWs and Audis and Mercedes and they determined through all of their changes they made that this has the best throttle response in its class. One of the things they did other than improve the uh, airflow and they improved it by something like 46%, which is a huge reason why this produces more power than the CTSV. Which this, is what? This makes 668 horsepower, so basically 670. And when people are dynoing these cars, I've seen a bunch of different dyno sheets, they make 620 horsepower to the rear wheels. Wow. And about the same amount of torque. And if you know anything about GM V8s, is the torque and horsepower graph is basically two flat lines on top of one another. So this should feel very similar to the ZL1. Essentially, yes. Okay. In a 4,200 pound package. Yeah, in a four door car. Yes, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, the last thing I will talk about is if there's really a, a con to this, and there has to be some price, and that is you get range anxiety in a gas powered car, Mark. When you drive this like God intended, uh, you get about eight miles to the gallon or 8.8, mm. .8, and this thing only has a 16 gallon tank. So oh, wow, that's it. You do the math there. It's like a, the GT500 problem. Oh, exactly. Yeah, where uh, you're. <laughs> Uh, or if you're driving this more like a refined gentleman, you're getting low tens. And this has AFM though, the CT4 doesn't, right? Yes, so the CT4V does not, that V6 does not have AFM, this does. Which is cylinder management, so it will deactivate cylinders randomly to so you don't burn up a, a specific cylinder from overheating. And it. theoretically, it improves fuel economy, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know what you're getting into here with this. I mean, it, it's an Best irrelevant... Best case scenario, you have a 288-mile range on the highway. Okay. What else did they do here, Jack, aside from the ridiculous cooling system? So when it comes to cooling, so as we talked about, there is a uh, trans and diff cooler in the lower part. They have a improved capacity or efficiency, sorry. They decrease the size of the intercooler for this TVS blower, but it is like 20-odd percent more efficient than the prior generation uh, CTSV LT4 configuration. So it is more thermally efficient. So theoretically, when you're going flat out, you don't have any cooling problems. Obviously, there's a high and low temp radiator as well. Yeah, well, and the, the low temp system is directly in line. You know, it's directly cooled at all times, at all speeds. So, I mean, the way that they've developed the Aero, uh, I'd be shocked if we have any temperature issues with this thing, but I guess we're going to find out. Yes, last thing, the oiling system, again, not a dry sump, but it does have a baffled oil pan. Okay. And theoretically, unlike a Z06 or a ZL1, due to the sheer mass of this thing, you won't be hitting the requisite Gs where the sloshing around may cause an issue. That said, this still does pull well over 1.1 1. 1 G or something. Okay. So, Mark, with that, let's uh, head back to Autobahn Country Club. Yeah, let's do it. of power yeah rear wheel drive, drive. <laughs> and you, you just spent 25 minutes listening to us ramble in the shop let's see hopefully we can kind of translate to what all this technology means so jack let's start with the engine 
What, uh, what's your thoughts? It's amazing. This thing is a sledgehammer. A very hairy chested kind of car. Lots of torque, lots of horsepower. In inclement weather like this, it definitely does struggle to put the power down. <laughs> but it is a very addicting power, <laughs> power plant, to say the least, Mark. The gearbox, something you talked about in the ATSV, it's good. It has a great sense of mechanical feel. The pedal box, easy to heel toe. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh um, yeah, I love it. I love it. I think that's the best part about this car is, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs in modern cars with uh, manual gearboxes where they're kind of half-assed. This is probably one of the best. And yeah, it's a Tremec, so I, I get it. This gearbox that shared somewhat the, the architecture in other cars is such a joy to drive that it transforms this car so much. Uh, the automatic would lose so much character. Um, you just love to shift it. The gearing is good. The feel is good. The engagement is good. If you're buying this car, you are missing out if you do not get the manual. Unless you have some re reason yeah. you, you can't get it. I, I, absolutely. Uh, the engine, I will say, is, you know, this is that GM engine family. It feels very similar to what you get in the Camaro ZL1. It just, this car feels heavier. Yeah. Uh, even in, you know, kind of this track setting, there's more pitch, there's more dive, there's more roll. You can't hide the fact that it's a big, heavy GT style car, <laughs> but it is remarkable the things that it can do and the speed that you can achieve in a straight line is, is just amazing. Yeah, you can fly in this car, Mark, and I'm braking way earlier than I normally would. Yeah. Being on a wet track, but this thing is very, very fast. Let's talk about engine noise, Mark. That's something we normally don't talk about in the track segments. This is augmented. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't bring it up in the shop, but it does have uh, synthesized engine tones, uh, and partly it's because the audio system has noise cancellation. It's a quieter cabin, so they have to add certain frequencies back through the, the through the speakers. And we asked Cadillac why they didn't do like an induction tube, like the LC500. And their ex explanation was it's the com complexity, cost, and then you can't completely get rid of that induction tone all the time without complicated valving. So they just cho choose to, to, to pump in certain frequencies that augment the engine. And I got to say, I, I don't like it. I, th I think, especially even with the helmet on, it's, it's amplifying the wrong frequencies for me. Um, especially when you think about a car like a GT500. Yes. Like, think about the induction tone that's in that car just naturally. That's amazing. It can be done. But, again, compromised luxury car, right? On the outside, though, Mark. And admittedly, I guess it doesn't really matter when you're inside yeah. this car. But on the outside, this thing sounds <laughs> pretty fucking incredible. Well, and that, that's, that's also the thing that bothers me because I can't hear the exhaust in here. I mean, you can't hear just how loud it is on the outside. I mean, you, you feel the vibration, but you don't get that tonal sense that everybody else is getting out there. I wish there was more of it in here. But anyway, that, that's kind of a subjective feeling. The brakes in this car, I know... It's kind of hard to really express how amazing these things are, but I did drive this car a couple days ago out here by myself without cameras in the dry, and you can go flat out in this car and not run into any issues as far as uh, brake fade or anything like that. It's, it's, it's every bit as capable as we talked about in the How show. many laps did you run? I ran probably 20, 20 minutes flat okay. out, you know, eight or nine tenths, and zero issues oh, with brake This is a very heavy car, so you do have to brake earlier than, say, in a, you know, a C7 or a C6 Corvette, but... And its tendency will be to understeer yes. if you don't get it right. And that understeer does transition into oversteer, of course, with the power. Yes. Um, but, yeah, you, again, I think they did a good job making it safe. Uh, again, if this was, like, if you were telling me this was just a pure precision track car, I would not be okay with as much an understeer that's in here, but I feel like it's safe and it's manageable. And you can get around it with tire pressure and a little, the way you brake and turn in. The, the body control, though, for a car that is as comfortable as it is on the street, and we talked about that in our street drive where I drove this thing like an asshole, but this car does have a really good Jekyll and Hyde personality. And if you are that 1% of person who's going to drive this on the track like we're doing right now for, you know, a couple sessions, I'm sure you're going to be blown away by this thing. I'm having way more fun driving this car out here or, or, or had when it was dry than I did in the E63. 
Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is this is a great example of a type of car that you are not taking to the trek. And, you know, I'll take the LC out here just as a joke once or twice a year. Yeah. But And that's what you're going to do with this. You're going to take it once or twice just because you went out there and you wanted to drive it. And there's so much more character in this car and engagement than something like the M5. And this isn't trying to be an M5. No, and it's not. And it's better for it. And it feels better to drive. It feels faster, even though you're probably not going to pull the same lap times that you would in an M5. But it is just, it feels more alive. I, and it's it, its something that you can't explain to somebody until you get behind the wheel of this. The, the vibration, the feeling, the gearbox, all these things add back that driving engagement. Even though there's a ton of electronics behind it helping you, you still feel like you're driving the car. If you're on the, let's call it the edge of, or the fence of buying a car like this or buying this specific car, just buy one. It is everything you want a vehicle like this to be. If you love Cadillac, you love CTSVs, or you want a more refined Hellcat experience, this is exactly that car. Yeah, I would say, you know, like if the ZL1 1LE or ZL1 was too too much of a missile for you, too, too impractical, this is basically giving you 75% of that car in a more usable GT car package with back seats and the more comfortable part about driving on the street. And that leads me to the last thing. What's the damping like? You know, I could tell this has the magnetic dampers instantly with the way that it behaves and the way that it rides but how is you've driven it more on the street how does it compare to other vehicles this is um to me this is actually softer than like the e63 amg s it is it is a really really deceptively comfortable car mark you can be doing 100 miles an hour down the highway on illinois highways where you know the pavement is just garbage and it, it soaks up perfectly. It's almost one of the reasons why this car is somewhat numb. I can tell what the front and rear are doing, but it isn't a car that I'm trying to, doesn't speak to you away like a Lotus or any of the real dedicated sports cars do. And that's because even though it is a Magna Rye car that can go stiff, it's softness and it's isolation from NVH and a lot of the feedback uh, hurts it. It helps it as a street car, but it does hurt it as a track car, if that rambling makes sense. No, it makes sense. I mean, it's just, again, it's the compromised part of trying to have a car being able to have two characters. And I think tuning-wise, what they set up here is a great dual-purpose car. I think they did find the right balance, and they did strip out the character like a lot of the other luxury barges. So, Jack, I think it's a good time to get into the final thoughts. This has been an insanely long journey, so let's do it. All right, Mark. Final thoughts on the Cadillac CT5V Blackwing. And I wanted to say this once again. Huge thanks to Ben Pohl of Brembo, Stefan Cross of Cadillac, and Tony Roma, who's the chief engineer on this thing. Without them, we would not have been able to do anything as comprehensive as we did in this video. So please thank them in the comments. So what about the car? Well, the CT5V Blackwing is one of my favorite cars of 2021. It is like a silverback gorilla in a suit. It is extraordinarily entertaining and it has so much character and a segment that is losing its soul. You compare that to the E63 route we reviewed this year, which is $140,000, <laughs> it's pretty hard to make an argument that car is $30,000 better than this. So what are its cons? Well, the first being fuel economy. <laughs> you will not win an award from Greenpeace driving this thing. You would be lucky to get 11 miles per gallon in the city, particularly if you drive this at all spiritedly. One on the highway, even if you drove this like Al Gore, you would barely get 20 miles to the gallon, barely. When compared to something like an M5 or an E63, this car relies on far more steel than aluminum, where in an M5 you have a carbon roof and aluminum body panels. Most of this vehicle is steel. The last con is the interior space. When compared to an E63 or an M5, it lacks some of the refinement and luxury features found in those cars, but at least the Cadillac maintains a gimmickless interior that relies essentially entirely on physical controls. So with that said, huge thanks to Cadillac for giving us these cars. Thanks to the viewers for watching, and I hope to see you soon. My GoFundMe didn't work, so I had to fucking delaminate a tire to get some hair plugs put in. How do I look, bro? <laughs> How do I look? Real good. <laughs>